butchers throwing their food waste in, in streets or waterways or clamp down on pigs from roaming in the streets and kind of eating bits of offal that would have been dumped there. The butchers have to make contracts with leather makers so that, or the other way around, so that they can collect this leftover animal product. But yeah, it's, it's a very messy history. Um, <laughs> and like I say, you know, from the medieval era onwards, you get many angry authorities trying to manage the butchers who just because they've got so much, they just throw it into the streets, right? You know, food waste on this mass kind of capitalist globalised scale is, of course, a modern issue. But... It wasn't as wonderful as we might assume. Mm. Refrigeration, frozen food, canned food, all this on our fingertips. Imagine a world that none of the above were available. What would we do with all the glut and abundance of uh, produce? How would you have your pasta with tomato sauce in the winter? The problem of refrigeration, it was something that even Einstein was uh, trying to solve back in 1926. Einstein and Szilard, they patented uh, a new refrigeration device in 1930s. They were trying to improve home refrigeration technology. And they made an absorption refrigeration with, with no moving parts, which operated at, at constant pressure and um, without electricity. But this one was never commercialized. Hello, my name is Thomas Dinas, and this is the Delicious Legacy Podcast. Welcome back to another food adventure through space and time. Everything in its place. That's easy. With my Frigidaire cold pantry. So true, Mrs. Doughty. In your Frigidaire cold pantry, there's a place for all your food. Fresh and frozen, canned, bottled and wrapped, new bought and leftover. They're all right there, and they're all at your fingertips. Let's start with the most ingenious door in any refrigerator. It has special places for bottles, spreadable butter, cheeses, even leftovers, and a big picture window hydrator for fruit. We all know vegetables. how good a fresh fruit or a vegetable tastes just plucked from the ground or from the tree. And we are also so used of having fresh fruits, winter, summer, and every season, and any kind we like, from strawberries to apples to oranges, melons, grapes, and so on. Yet, these two extremes of um, our food systems, having your own freshly grown food all the time, or being able to buy fresh fruits and vegetables all year round, are not the norm. And in a sense, throughout history, They were the norm as well. Even fresh food for people who lived in cities was uh, more difficult to access anyway. Inherently, the problem always was a problem of waste and leftovers. What do you do with an abundance of fresh vegetables in the summer and nothing in the winter? What will you do when you slaughter an animal? Are you going to waste some of it? Is it some of it going to spoil and thrown away? Inherently, humans always had this uh, dilemma and these questions and uh, they found ingenious ways to solve it. Wasting food was always a morally charged issue, something challenging. And let's not forget that this fake age of abundance that we live now, it didn't really exist before our very modern post-World War II era. So with uh, the technologies of canning food, and of uh, frozen food and refrigeration that came into our lives, people were able to save food and not waste and have more fresher food, but also at the same time, as these things grew and grew and grew into huge industries, using more energy and more resources, also means more possibilities for wasting food throughout that chain. If food comes from um, very far away and so on. We are aware of our food waste nowadays. There is, there is more awareness about it because of the climate uh, crisis and the environmental issues. But this is not a new problem for humanity, as I said earlier. It was always the case, even when there was um, far, less, um, far less of a product to go about and uh, there were ingenious ways of uh, preserving it, like salting it, pickling or uh, sugaring um, or drying and smoking. 
and this is what uh, the new book uh, from Eleanor Barnett is all about, Leftovers. And she shares with us the untold story of food waste and preservation, in Britain specifically, from the Tudor era to the present day, and of course, the future too. So the book is released uh, tomorrow, 14th of March. So please enjoy our conversation about her new book. Dr. Ellen Barrett, welcome to the Delicious Legacy Podcast. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Uh, it's very good to have you here. Tell us a little bit about um, yourself. Who are you? What do you do? And um, how did you get involved with food history? Sure. Yeah. So, so I'm a food historian. I'm, I'm, I use food as this particularly engaging, enlightening kind of lens through which to, to access the daily lives and values of ordinary people in the past as opposed to kind of solely thinking about, you know, the history of kings and queens, for example. It's this amazing tool to access, yeah, what people's identities were and what they were doing day to day. In particular, what my PhD was on and now what I kind of work on as a researcher at Cardiff Uni is the links between food and different religious identities in the early modern period, which of course is this time of great religious change. So you have the reformations, time of globalization, colonization, and food exchange between people of different countries and cultures. Um, But my second area of expertise and what my new book, Leftovers, is all about is the history of food waste and preservation. Brilliant. Thank you. So Eleanor, tell me a little bit about uh, your new book. What is it about? Yeah, so Leftovers looks at the many ingenious ways that people in the past have sought to prevent food from going to waste in Britain. So thinking about how they've done that through preservation, using up leftovers in creative new dishes, and then recycling or reusing the food scraps that they ended up not eating. So asking how food waste has been understood in the past and why people wasted food. And in doing so, I end up exploring a whole range of themes that we can talk about, you know, from religious belief, food and gender divisions, wealth and inequality, and uh, yeah, of course, of climate change and um, environmentalist movements. Mm. Lovely. That makes um, a lot of um, sense because we as a species generally, not only in this country, but um, we forget that um, our very much abandoned phase of food is very modern. It's very recent, like after World War II, and especially the last 40 years or so. Uh, Before that, there was always a a fight between feeding and uh, constantly uh, trying to find new sources of food and preserving the food in many different ways. Even up to the 20th century, really, uh, like we forget how recent the whole thing is, to be honest. Yeah. I mean, yeah, the, I think we maybe had a, a taste of what life could be like in the pandemic uh, or what life was like for some people in the past. And we all started not wasting as much food. But interestingly, I think very quickly after the lockdowns, we then went back to our previous levels of food waste. Mm. So but perhaps that says something about human nature. Okay. Yeah. I thought it might have been a little bit better, but clearly not. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, because during lockdown, we basically, there was shortages, right? For many, many reasons, yes. of course. Yeah. So people made their own bread, um, they tried to buy flour and make sourdough, they did their own cakes, they tried to do a lot of preserves and stuff. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And I think people just valued food more because we had less access to it. You know, it was a shock when we went to the supermarket and there were limits on certain items. Yeah. Uh, or some things were just you just couldn't get anymore, and lots of people ended up growing their own food as well. You know, even if just on a on a window sill in a window mm. box, that sort of thing. We very quickly went back to kind of modern life and all the sort of rushing around and commuting and um, <laughs> things that mean that we just don't have the time or the mental energy really to think about food and food waste. Unfortunately, true. That's true. So. I mean, food waste is a pretty much um, interesting topic in itself, but also very, very current, very, very in vogue because what, with what is happening in the world and climate crisis and um, food poverty and food waste. Um, so 
was this one reason that um, you came about writing this book? How did you come about um, thinking of having a book about food waste and history? And Yeah, no, definitely. So I see food waste a lot in the news. So stopping food from going, ending up in the bin is obviously a huge part of the modern fight against climate change. Perhaps you're familiar with the, I think the main statistic that you kind of see thrown around is that a third of the food we produce globally today goes to waste. And if all this, yeah, it it really, if you think about it, that is, that is crazy, right? A third. And if all of that needlessly discarded food were a country, it would be the third biggest emitter of greenhouse gases after China and the US. So it really is a huge modern day problem. And obviously as a food historian, I started thinking, you know, how has food waste been understood and managed in the past? Um, You know, how did we end up being such a wasteful society? And what might studying people's leftovers kind of tell us about our shared history, you know, and what can we learn from it? Mm. Um, and, and I was quite surprised, actually, that there really is very little historical research on this topic, despite the fact that it's so so pressing and topical. Right, right, I see. Because um, I I grew up <laughs> from a family that obviously they, they were all saying, don't waste your food, eat your food and all that stuff. And um, I grew up with um, both my grandparents, uh, maternal and paternal, um, and uh, especially my grandmothers, they were always um, uh, creating food from a very scant ingredients, very little stuff, and they always used to tell us stories about Second World War in Greece when um, there was uh, basically famine because uh, the German Nazis, the occupation, they were taking all the food. And I remember my one of my grandmothers saying they had just dry bread from the bran of the wheat uh, made just that and some um, ba- basically sesame oil which obviously for Greeks it's not uh, <laughs> it's not a good quality oil and um, yeah that that was it and it was countless stories and countless days of um, <laughs> of that so the their food waste was minimal and um, that's only like a couple of generations ago and yet today you say about a third of all food which is uh, mental. So yeah, for, for me, yeah, food waste, it's something that um, obviously I see it in the news. I'm trying not to, yeah, I don't really have much food waste, but yeah, we, we do produce a lot of food waste. Um, so thinking about previous generations, um, I'm not so sure how, how much wa- food was wasted. I, I, th- I would have thought that it was very little, I suppose, like historically. Yeah, so there are certainly periods of history when, like the Second World War, which maybe we could talk about in a, bit more detail later mm-hmm. um where you know there was this urgency about reducing your food waste and the government and the state stepped in as well to enforce rules um but more generally people were used to living in kind of i suppose within their means in a smaller food system than we are today mm. so of course today you kind of go to the supermarket and there's just endless things right there's endless packets and you kind of forget that in the past, you would have had to grow your own food, um, preserve your own food, slaughter your own animals. And so when you had that kind of value behind food, you wouldn't have wasted so much. I think that's the big difference from mm. from today. But I do think a lot of people might assume that this book is going to be one that tells you to stop wasting food by going back to kind of the you know good old days. Mm. Um, and that's not quite what it is. So <laughs> there are... I kind of wanted to show that the reasons that we waste food actually still do echo throughout history. So to take one example, if we go back to the Tudor times, kings and queens would have had access to far more food than they could possibly eat. And they would have had, you know, huge tables with big meat pies and um, endless sugar courses with sugar sculptures Mm -hmm. and all this sort of thing. And meanwhile, the poor would have been struggling and to kind of um, glean scraps from the harvest or they, they rioted because they didn't have access to enough bread to sustain themselves. So like today, I think when people have access to a lot of food, they tend to waste more of it, even if that's at the expense of the poor, for example. Mm, yeah, that's that's always a risk. It was always a constant risk. I mean, uh, yeah, we forget that people were always on the verge of starvation for long periods in the past. And you had to find ways when you have fresh food, fresh food will go off for various reasons, not because you're a wasteful person or a wasteful society, right? Yeah, of course. Uh, yeah, of course. The other thing is, is that artificial refrigeration is a very modern thing. Um, you know, the majority of British homes wouldn't have had a, a fridge or a freezer until the late 20th century. So 
of course, um, it, they had to come up with other ways of making their food last longer, um, mm. you know, through sugaring. So if you eat sugar fruits um, or vegetables, you know, making pickles, fermenting, dehydrating, all of those kind of traditional ways of storing your food that we've, I think, kind of lost lost touch with a little bit. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we, we still eat pickles, I suppose, <laughs> and um, some preserves like jams and marmalades. But it's more like factory manufactured mainly. We we do tend to buy the stuff ready and we have it as a complement to our myriad of uh, fresh food and uh, selections from supermarkets and so on, right? Uh, so basically preserves such as pickles and jams were quite a um, significant amount of calories and foods in the past was one of the part of the of the diet. Yeah, definitely. It would have been, and not just pickles and preserves, but things like cheese. We forget that cheese is a way of preserving milk. So lots of the kind of everyday foods were actually preserves. I mean, even butter is a way of preserving milk, if you think about it. Mm. Yeah. And of course, um, until, you know, relatively recently in our history, food was grown locally and you had to be reliant on the seasons. Um, So you just wouldn't have thought that you could get fruit throughout the winter right so it was an important part of for example in the Tudor era it was sort of wealthy uh, gentle women a big part of their sort of ritual year I suppose was um, collecting the fruit in from their orchards or or gardens from the autumn and then preserving them in sugary preserves so that they could have those amazing flavors throughout the winter period if you were poorer or you might have had like a kind of a pig a cottage pig yeah and you would have slaughtered that in the autumn and then you know eaten what you could then but you would have preserved things in brines um you know even preserve the bones so that you can use them later Mm. Um, so in your book, um, how far are you going back uh, trying to find um, history of food waste? What, what's uh, the periods you're covering? Yeah, so it's a big history. It starts off um, in the Tudor kitchen mm-hmm. uh, and it goes all the way to the present day. And mm. so, you know, we're going through um, industrial revolution, agricultural revolution, the Victorian era, the pandemic as well, recently, the world wars. And then I kind of end by thinking also about the future of food as well. I see, I see, yeah. Obviously, the main part of preserving in the past and not wasting food was pickles, and that's part of your first um, chapter in the book. So we were talking about pickles and salt and cheese and all these um, all these uh, different um, preserves. And then um, on the second chapter, uh, you're talking about um, Mark Hill, Skin, Sand and Trails. That's, that's the title of the <laughs> Tell us a little bit about um, what this chapter covers, basically. Yeah, so if, if the first chapter is more about how was food waste understood, um, what do they do with their leftovers kind of in the household, the next chapter thinks about inedible bits of food waste. So think about, you know, apple cores, bits of animal carcasses that can't be eaten. And in doing so, I kind of end up telling a story there about the rise of public health initiatives that mm. clamp down on things like butchers throwing their food waste in in streets or waterways or clamp down on pigs from roaming in the streets and kind of eating bits of offal that would have been dumped there. So yeah, that's the other thing uh, about this topic that it's one thing thinking about food waste in our homes, but of course this is a wider issue with kind of the development of industries, food industries, and what do they do with their food waste? So that's another story that I tell throughout the book. Yeah, absolutely. Which we yeah we're gonna check um, a little bit later on. And um, yeah, you, for, you forget obviously as a, as a person, as a reader, or as a, someone who cooks every day, we forget. Okay, one thing is to preserve stuff, another thing is to eat all our fresh food or share it equally and so all that, but also all the inedible stuff that left over. So they are part of uh, a system that can be good one, like using all these uh, remains, or it could be wasteful. And um, I believe in the past, um, this was more of a, like you could use the skins or, as you said, the bones earlier on, or you could make um, shoes and clothes and all that stuff. But as this um, process kind of uh, went away from the home, from the small artisan industries and went to bigger and um, more industrial uh, size with thousands and thousands of animals being slaughtered every day, then this uh, basically waste, what happens to it? I mean, do we know? I mean, is this used or it's been just thrown away and that contributes to all this uh, environmental mess and to the food waste that you're talking about? 
Exactly, yeah. So it is a big problem that the kind of government and state has to get involved in to kind of manage because like you sort of suggest before these bigger industries developed, you'd have one pig to slaughter, right? So you would use everything that you could from that pig, you know, even the fat, you would make it into a tallow candle, which was the only light that you would have access to before artificial, you know, electric lights. Mm -hmm. But then the candle makers develop on an industrial scale, leather makers industrial scale. And so it's a history of what are the kind of connections that they build up amongst themselves to make use of all of those animal products. So the butchers have to make contracts with leather makers so that or the other way around so that they can collect this leftover animal product. But yeah, it's it's a very messy history. Yeah. <laughs> um, and like I say, you know, from the medieval era onwards, you get many angry authorities trying to manage the butchers who just because they've got so much, they just throw it into the streets, right? Right. So basically, as a civilization, as a society, we were always a bit messy and wasteful, um, one way or another, really. There's no rose-tinted glasses that the past was better. <laughs> yeah, it's, I think it's just more complex than that. And I do think people, there's a tendency to think that, you know, it was all perfect back then and we've kind of lost our way. Mm. You know, food waste on this mass kind of capitalist, globalized scale is, of course, a modern issue. Yeah. But it wasn't as wonderful as we might assume. Mm. Um, you know, the other thing we could look at if we look in the Victorian era, it is that there's kind of like a urban sort of salvaging market. Yeah. Um, so people, richer households would kind of sell their the leftovers from their roast dinners or mm -hmm. their hair skin when they've got and they've had hair. But the people that are collecting that are very, very impoverished and they're selling crumbs to people who are living in in slums to live off or stale bread and things like that so of course in one way they are saving those those scraps but that isn't a society that we would really emulate today yeah so yeah it's more complicated than just saying it was wasteful or it wasn't wasteful if you see yeah. what i mean yeah yeah and, and a lot of it goes also to the morality and of the past societies as well like how moral was to waste or how ethical was to waste the, f the food back then and um, how is that connected also to the religion to christianity and what were the, the norms basically what was the, the church authorities i would say what what would they say about these things yeah so it's certainly in the kind of tudor era bearing in mind this is when the reformation happens, happens or yeah. has happened mm. so religion is you know is a, a heightened importance or concern and that religious outlook was really universal so it's really no surprise that food was understood through a religious lens as something that's given by god and you know it's the thing that sustained human or bodily life you know as opposed to spiritual or the afterlife so it was seen as this great gift and therefore to waste it was a great abuse and a and a sin even of that kind of heavenly gift so of course that's tied with morality, um, you know, not letting the poor starve whilst the rich are eating these lavish meals and wasting it. Today, even maybe people are still aware of that biblical story, Lazarus and Devise, uh, Dives, when it's the rich man who refuses to give the scraps from his meal to the beggar and then he's denied heaven, basically. So people were certainly taught then through sermons not to waste their food, but because, you know, it could go to people who were, who were starving. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, so I think this uh, globalized food system today, which uh, it can be very efficient in many ways, we tend to exploit all the different um, individual parts rather than uh, trying to bring them together and feed all people, just exploit them for profit, I suppose. And then it means that a lot of people starving when there's surplus in food in other places. And also we underuse our own food. Um, it's country, let's say. It's country's food security systems, in a sense. And we're relying in them um, further and further away for for feeding the citizens of, of a country. And it's very prominent now in UK as well. I mean, you, you hear about deals with Australia or New Zealand or whatever and Canada and it's like, but why don't we try and grow the food here and get some food security in a world that is very fragmented? <laughs> um, yeah, so that's a big issue, isn't it? It's, um, you know, the modern food industry tends to be, well, like capitalism, really. It's based on getting the cheapest price, right? Getting more of our food grown abroad and transported across the world and all, all the damage that that, that causes. 
I'll be back after this short break. Mm. Uh, I mean, let's talk about this um, later on. Let's so let's um, let's go back a little bit again. So the next chapter talks about um, the invention of uh, tin can, right? And we are in an, in an era of uh, industrial and agricultural revolutions, and we are kind of in the 19th century now. And on that era, we have a lot of um, people trying to invent <laughs> um, a way to preserve food for long journeys, I suppose, right? Yes, yeah. So I guess this chapter is really the start of that kind of cold chain, global cold chain that now gets us our food from across the world out of season. So it talks about how inventions in food preservation, one being artificially refrigerated ships, which is a, yeah, a bit later in the century, and the other being the tin can, how they helped people whether that be, you know, explorers, colonists, you know, or, or, or transporters of food, travel further around the world um, and bring back food from elsewhere and also transport our food across the world. The tin can is, perhaps we don't think of it like that today. We sort of forget that tin cans are sort of just in the cupboard, aren't they? We, yeah. <laughs> we don't really think much <laughs> of them, really. We don't tend to think of it as uh, our favourite food, I suppose. It's almost like emergency supplies, isn't it? But mm. the tin can really revolutionised our ability to to feed sailors and travellers, explorers who were, you know, travelling across the world because it allowed to have access to more nutritious food that wasn't heavily salted. So before uh, the tin can, you would have had very, very dry ship's biscuit, or you would have had a very, very heavily salted meat. Mm. Um, or if people were transporting meat uh, across seas, they might have actually taken live livestock, which um, was in high numbers wasted, essentially, because um, it's very d- dangerous for them to travel overseas. So on balance, it was this incredible invention. But of course, in all in- these inventions in food preservation actually came with a lot of waste, So there was a big scandal in the mid 19th century Mm -hmm. when Stephen Goldner, who who had been supplying the British Navy with tin cans, they were found to be rotten, essentially. And so there's these awful stories of people going on these big excursions and then getting halfway. And then there's this awful stench. And it's because they've got rotten supplies. Um, (laughs) Yeah. And of course, that's, you know, it's essential for feeding yourself. So it was, um, you know, people died because of it as well. Um, so it goes to like a parliament select committee in, yeah, in the mid 19th century. And it's a yeah big scandal. And people are, because of that, quite scared of the tinned food. And it does take a, a while then, you know, at least 50 years for it to start being sold really for household consumption. Yeah, absolutely. Like it is today, yeah. Yeah, because I mean, initially, I mean, we think about it now more like tin tomatoes or beans and something like that, but it was a lot more to do with trying to preserve meat, I suppose, for this long genesis. They had stews and things like that in cans, right? If it's not cooked properly or if it's not sealed properly and um, how do you keep the air airtight and uh, how do you cook it and all that stuff and then um, people getting uh, poisoning food poisoning or botulism and um, yeah then you, you scare the general population and then that's <laughs> that's a very good tactic for uh, selling more <laughs> more thing canned food um, yeah so it took uh, like at least until the end of the 19th century to become more of a or even 20th century right to become more household yeah, the start of the 20th century, really, mm. yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, with new techniques and new innovations on creating the cans themselves. Yeah, I suppose it's like anything. It just takes a while for those methods to be perfected. Yeah. On on the similar era, so uh, we have also the frozen food, as you, as you mentioned. Um, initially, they refrigerated fridges, but then similar time, like the end of the 19th century, we have frozen food as well coming into, into vogue, in a sense. Do you remember the very first example of um, cargo travelling across the, the globe from one place to bring food? Yeah, so this is, these are experiments in artificial refrigeration in ships is, is in the 1870s, really. Mm-hmm. And primarily it's trying to ship meat from Australia and New Zealand where they've got an excess of um, animals, especially sheep, to Britain. And again, that's another one 
you know, there are successful ones and, you know, that would have been incredible. Imagine it's travelled from the other side of the world that really was revolutionary. But there were several examples when this didn't work. So 1873, there was a ship that had this new technology in it um, trying to get from Melbourne to London, which ended up having 20 tonnes of mutton and beef, which was just completely gone off by the time it reached the UK. (laughs) Uh, yeah, and, the, and then, you know, there's several examples of that, those sort of unsuccessful missions. Could you imagine being a sailor on that ship? <laughs> I know, it's just awful. And and there's some that don't even, you know, leave the port because um, the refrigerant explodes everywhere and there's ammonia everywhere, which, of course, is dangerous. Oh, wow. um, okay. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, it, it, it's incredible. And again, we rely on it so much today, not just the ships, but then there has to be refrigerated kind of areas at the port where it can be stored before it goes off to shops and or whatever we rely on that so much but you know it's really quite quite a modern invention but you know over time in the victorian era this meant that people would start having access to cheaper meat that had come from the other side of the world mm. yeah we kind of think it as a given now it wasn't at all roughly 150 years more or less that uh, becomes a bit more common For example, this advert from uh, Bird's Eye for frozen food. Uh, I mean, it's hard to imagine how much of a novelty frozen food was and how much of a difference made um, in product transported from the other side of the world and um, and how the boundaries of um, fresh and um, frozen product can be blurred nowadays. And that's the news from Bird's Eye. Seafood, frozen, fresh from the sea, this new vacuum-sealed cooking pack makes it possible. Let's Bird's Eye bring you seafood this fresh with flavor this delicious. Look, filet of flounder amandine. Flounder caught off the coast of Newfoundland, filleted and quickly frozen. Then vacuum-sealed, fresh. You cook it this easy. See, actually bastes itself to golden goodness. Open. Seafood fresh from the sea in butter sauce with lemon and white wine. Try all five new seafood dishes from Bird's Eye. And then obviously refrigeration for the house itself, it's a later invention. Yes, yeah. Oh, yeah, I- invented. I suppose with all these things, there's a kind of debate about who's the first to mm. invent it. But it doesn't end up in households in the UK, at least until really yeah, the end of the 20th century, which is really, really recent. Mm. Um Like, yeah, people who were born or who grew up, you know, post-war, it wouldn't have been, you you know, you would have um, put your milk in the um, the pantry or it it just wouldn't have been part of your your daily life. Yeah, true, true. Um, Do we know who invented the first fridge, let's say? Like I say, there's a lot of debate, but the first kind of commercial household fridge is 1913, I believe. Right. Um, But like I say, it takes a long time for it to be actually usable within the household mm, yeah um yeah and there's there's loads the story of artificial refrigeration you know it really does it goes back into the tudor era when um they're experimenting with understanding what artificial coldness is and there's a story of someone a scientist who dies from stuffing a, a chicken basically with, with snow and ends up dying from uh, pneumonia right so it goes back that far and then throughout history it's this big big debate and you know even einstein invents a fridge at one point which is quite revolutionary but which isn't a commercial success yes you say about that fridge which doesn't use electricity and it doesn't use ammonia so it was yeah that was the big thing that refrigerants would leak and they were fatal. So um, he came up with a with a way, essentially, of not having to use those types of chemicals. But like I say, the, the type of fridge that we ended up with is is very different. Yeah, and, damn. You know, that, that technology <laughs> is still changing all the time. Mm. I'm just kind of trying to imagine a fridge that uh, doesn't use some electricity as we use today because it's very energy consumptive <laughs> device or leaking ammonia. And if what if that was the invention that was successful commercially? It would be a lot better for the environment as well. Yeah, interesting, yeah. There's another thing like that, I believe. Um, yeah, with the toilets, for example, like on the 19th century when they invented the toilets and the, the, the whole system the in London, right, that um, there was a system that was supposed to have two different um, waste uh, pipes, one for liquid and one for solids. So they would be separated from the household in, so you could use the, the solids for uh, manure. But that was more expensive system, and they had all the manure from the horses and the animals, so they didn't go for it, I believe. Yeah, yeah. And then obviously, 20th century comes, and we have cars, 
so you don't have manure, so you have to find what you find um, <laughs> nitrogen. So you have to to invent artificial systems for that. So yeah, it's kind of interesting. Like what what if we yeah what could have been yeah again yeah that has to do with waste as well. I mean we kind of very much related. So yeah, at the same time with um, with all these inventions and revolution and early twentieth century, we also have. Um, the wars, we have two big world wars. And you talk on your book about that, right? Yes. So after kind of looking at the Victorian era and that kind of um, food waste kind of economy that develops, I then go into the world wars. So just before the world wars, I think we were sort of becoming a bit wasteful. And then suddenly <laughs> you get this block on food and suddenly it becomes this really hugely valuable thing again. Needlessly wasting food that could have been eaten by people was actually made illegal. Rationing's introduced, of course, mm. uh, in, in both wars. And then just the way that people approach food who, who were on the at home, all leftovers were just reused, either in thrifty dishes, um, things like using stale crust to coat food for for frying mm. things like that or, or you could the food waste would have been collected to be made into non-food related items for the war effort so glycerin or extracted fats would go on to make fertilizers um, but also glue for aeroplanes and even explosives so there was these huge drives to collect leftovers for these purposes or to feed to pigs and then of course You've got this valuable meat supply. Yeah. And and the same, not just with um, food waste, but kind of kitchen waste more generally. So kitchen scrap, old pots and pans and things like that were were collected, especially by the women's voluntary service. Um, so women who, you know, they it's an incredibly important job um, in the wars that was um, perhaps not recognised so much. But teaching people how to to reuse their food waste, mm. um, use up their leftovers and, and physically collecting any salvage was an, a huge part of the war effort. Okay. Yeah, we, we kind of um, know a little bit about World War II and the rationing afterwards, and we know how much um, there was a lot of um, government and state effort, people to grow their own food, dig for victory and all that stuff. We have all that stuff. And then um, we arrive in a situation after World War II and after rationing, that um, we have seemingly a lot more abundance of food due to the industrial <laughs> um, big innovations that happened and they were implemented in our food systems. And uh, obviously, coming out of the war, you don't want the, the memories of poverty and hunger are fresh. So, yeah, there is an abundance of food. Yes, exactly. So you suddenly get this. People just don't want to think about being frugal anymore. So yeah. it's this kind of hopeful era and it's led by the United States because they're the only country that come out sort of profitable from yeah. from the war. And, you know, they're selling this. They've got um, refrigerate fridges in their households. And so they sort of sell this idea to people in Britain and Europe of kind of abundance. Mm. And with that abundance comes uh, <laughs> yep. waste. <laughs> comes waste, definitely, yeah. In your book, you then kind of going uh, into that era to the new era when we your chapter is called mcdonald's punks and food mm. anarchists what can you tell us about that um era yeah so that chapter is really i think where we start recognizing the world that i'm describing so it's the rise of um fast food which is wasteful in its quest to be non-wasteful but only when uh that's to do with profit right, right? so um they'll throw away the chickens that aren't productive, but are making, yeah, the high, the highest amount of profit that they can. It's also the rise of things like artificially produced um, new strains of, of uh, crops, which mm. are, again, highly productive, but then very damaging to the environment in other ways. The rise of um, use of artificial fertilizers, that sort of thing. So I kind of telling that story, the increase in waste in general. Um, so it's like I think it's nineteen seven by nineteen seventy, food waste had doubled from pre World War Two levels. So it really is this big boom. Um, you also get supermarkets, so people stop sort of going to the local shops to get what they need every day and start feeling like there's this endless abundance. They start shopping. Mm bigger shops but so less often sorry and then of course they've got starting to have um, refrigeration as well which is an amazing food um, preserver but at the same time leads to the wasteful behavior because like we do today you can kind of just fling it in the fridge and you almost forget about it yeah um, you think it's kind of got endless shelf life which it of course hasn't 
So I'm, I'm tracing that kind of the rise of, yeah, this kind of modern, mass-produced, globalised food system. Mm. But at the same time, it's about the countercultural movements that emerge to fight this. So there's the new environmentalist movement, which begins in the 1970s, which is trying to draw people's attention to the damages of these new crop strains that are, you know, highly dependent on um, these fertilizers and, and, and other pesticides, uh, pesticides, insecticides, other chemicals. And the damage that that does, and ultimately the waste that produces in its quest to be non-wasteful, if you see what I mean. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, punks as well. People who go uh, sifting through dustbins to find uh, leftover food. So, yeah, it's the tale of both that accumulation of food waste and also our fight against it in the modern era. Yeah, they, they kind of uh, emerge at the same time. <laughs> yeah, yeah, almost, yeah. Yeah, yeah, you have the counter movement on this um, continuous uh, food waste and uh, this abundance that seems to be almost excessive. You have all these movements coming out of that, trying to to say, okay, that's not um, sustainable in the long term. And um, yeah, talking about pesticides and insecticides and all that, I mean, that's a very important subject. Um, I mean, throughout humanity, um, the food was wasted even before it went to the table. <laughs> Of, of 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 humans, right? I mean, you had all these pests whenever you had a farm and you were growing whatever you were growing. You had slugs and snails and rats and um, insects. So food was wasted anyway in the past and people always tried to find ways to counter that with either poisons or traps or whatever and just became more efficient, I suppose, in our modern era. <laughs> um, yeah, and a lot more... Um, food um, didn't didn't get wasted that way but wasted in another way exactly <laughs> that's exactly it yeah so uh, yeah another thing is the rise of the monocultures so we used to have much more varied strains of different types of crops but the problem is is then if as what happened with the banana mm. um they get in, infected with a, a strain then they can't fight it off because that it's a monoculture there isn't a genetic diversity and so Actually, we used to have a whole different type of banana that we used to eat globally, uh, which got completely wiped out. And then now we have, according to most historical accounts, a less tasty banana, <laughs> yeah. less, less sweet banana, um, the Cavendish banana, which is now the one that is what we mean when we say banana. It's just this one monoculture. But that is also very vulnerable to viruses and the and, uh, rot. So... Again, it's it's kind of not wasteful in a way. You know, we might have made plants that are more productive um, for less space or that have less wasteful bits, you know, of seeds or things like that that we consider to be wasteful. But actually, this modern food system leaves us open to other types of food waste. Yeah. And um, what is the future? Because <laughs> mm. I think you explore that a little bit in your book, right? I do, yes. So it is a history, but like I say, it, because it, it kind of builds up to these modern problems, I felt like it would be remiss not to sort of think about, well, what does this mean? Can we kind of look back to the past as something we can learn from or, or not? Um, and, you know, what's being done at the, at the present? And I do think it, it's it's a tough to feel like we can make a difference, you know, without a big system overhaul, without, like I say, kind of tackling that globalised food system on, on a global scale with government action but also international action so on the one hand I do think you know the authorities will listen if we show that we care enough about it but the other thing is just day-to-day -day ordinary people we can just change our attitude to food you know if you realize that actually the abundance in supermarkets is an illusion you know that we need to reconnect with the true labor and costs that go into producing our food mm -hmm. you know perhaps then we'd waste less of it if you think that one orange uses up 50 liters of water to produce it wow. that it's grown in fields that are lavish with pesticides and artificial fertilizers that it's transported across skies mm. at every point using gas guzzling machines using fridges etc cetera, etc cetera. if you really truly understand that and kind of become knowledgeable about the food that you eat perhaps you know we would waste less and for me the actual act of writing a history about it but I hope also for people reading the history about it I hope that will kind of hit home that they're that in the past these were real people who who had to labor to to grow their food who had to preserve it you know etc etc mm. and uh 
perhaps that that alone is enough to sort of change our individual attitudes towards food it's more fun as well it's more exciting if you to like enjoy the pleasures of eating um but also growing food and also re- like constructing dishes or reimagining leftovers into something yeah. exciting you know actually there's a lot of fun that can be had with that it's not just this kind of boring i don't know sort of like poverty yes impoverished you know like it can you can have fun with yeah you can see it as as something miserable and um, soul destroying oh, yeah this. or you have to you can embrace it and say, oh, a bit of fun a bit oh, what can i do with these leftovers and how can i make them more exactly. interesting and, yeah uh, yeah um, that requires i guess a bit of effort initially on the, on the part of the individual uh, but i think uh, the more you do it then easier it becomes it's it's like okay now I have the the know-how and uh, the experience and I can make my dinner better very easily with um, and use all these leftovers and so on and so on which is yeah which is fun but i mean in terms of individuals yeah we do waste food and it's if you accumulate that it's it's huge but um, the supermarkets and the big uh, the big industries they have huge much 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 bigger uh, wastage of food right Yeah, well, so it's 70% in the UK is in households. So household food waste is the biggest producer of, of waste um, altogether. Mm. But you're, you're right that you need mass change at a kind of a wider level for sure. Um, and, and actually the supermarkets now are kind of signed up to projects that do help them reduce their food waste in general. So there is there is hope on in that in that sense. Mm, lovely. Um, just uh, to talk a bit about the past uh, generally even very far to to the rear or or whenever you have some um do you have any interesting uh, facts about uh, food waste from the past do you have something that like um i remember reading in the book about um, william shakespeare's father getting some fines uh, oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. um do you have a couple of these examples to tell us to give us sure um yes well so william shakespeare's father his name was john and so he was a, a curer of white leather and a, and a glover so he made gloves um, and those types of professions along with the butchers were really notorious for polluting streets with with the scrapings of fat from the animal skins or blood and other leftover kind of animal products so we know about him from a fine that survives from 1552 um <laughs> <laughs> for polluting the streets in Stratford because even back then there were laws introduced to get people to send that type of waste to muck hills outside of the city because of course it was a, a health concern to have all this animal bits like yeah, thrown ro- into the streets yeah rotting all the streets yeah, yeah. <laughs> other other interesting kind of facts from the book I find it really interesting looking at modern foods that are actually made from what was once considered waste. Mm. So Marmite is one. I know, love it or hate it. Some people hate it, <laughs> but some people love it. But even if you hate it, it's still interesting that it, it was actually invented in the early 20th century as a way of using up um, wasted yeast from a brewery nearby. Yes, yes. Which makes sense. And even skimmed milk in Edwardian England, it was seen as a waste product. It was thing that you would just you would just feed it to the pigs or you'd even just pour it down drains. Um so <laughs> because what they thought was the valuable thing was the the fattier milk, of the course. creamier milk. So it was only in World War Two actually that was kind of accepted as a drink in its own right. So yeah, I find that fascinating. Yeah, that's very interesting because yeah, yes. Nowadays, same skimmed and skimmed milk is <laughs> everywhere. But yeah, yeah, and if anything, we value it more, right? Because we're more conscious of, of health and we think it's healthier for us. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but I mean, that's a lesson, and yeah, uh, another thing to kind of that that I gained from the book is, is changing your attitude, right, to what waste is. Um, mm. a, a big one is thinking about. Uh, eating animals um, I think today we're, we're very very squeamish aren't we about what bits of the animal we deem to be edible yeah but of course you know it was a it was a delicacy in the past to have you know feet and and tongue and things like that yeah brawn the, the whole head uh, yeah yeah so maybe there's a case as well for rediscovering those those types of foods and wasting less in the process again perhaps in a fun way not ne- not in this like negative way that absolutely is often is often framed as you know it is a book that celebrates food ultimately yeah and yeah the different tastes and discoveries that that are, that are part of this history of food waste great i guess uh, the readers should take that home <laughs> yeah <laughs> when they read the book brilliant 
thank you so much uh, for um, your time today, Eleanor. You're welcome. It was really interesting talking to you. And um, tell us again uh, when the book is out and where people can find it. Yeah, so it's out on the 14th of March. And yeah, you can find it wherever you find your books, hopefully. <laughs> and it's out from uh, Head of Zeus, right? Head of Zeus, yeah. yeah. Brilliant. Thank you. Have a lovely day. You too. I hope you have some nice food, nice leftovers. <laughs> yes, actually, <laughs> I will. Well, that's all for today. Thanks to Eleanor Barrett for her time. And I hope you found this discussion fascinating and um, thought-provoking. Her new book comes out tomorrow. It's called Leftovers, A History of Food Waste and Preservation. And it's out by Head of Zeus. Remember, if you like this podcast, please rate and review and become a Patreon subscriber. This podcast wouldn't exist without your generous support. So thank you very much and see you soon. <laughs>